Family Theater presents Betty Lynn. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network in cooperation with Family Theater presents No Comment. And now, here is your star and host, Betty Lynn. Thank you, Tony Lafano. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, No Comment, starring Betty Lynn. To begin with, my real name isn't Jane Clausen, and I'm not a stenographer in the State Department. I work for an entirely different branch of the government. But the rest of this story, except for specific names and locations, is just as it happened in Washington less than five months ago. Uh, it's after six, Jane. Why don't you knock off? I thought I'd finish up these notes for you, Mr. Bracken. Well, they'll keep until tomorrow. What about the meeting with the undersecretary? Postpone. He has to make an appearance at some embassy clam bake. Now, what do you think of the terms of the trade agreement? Well, from what I've typed so far, they look wonderful. Hmm. And you might be interested to know that document was drawn up by three senators, two representatives, and two of our own people. Just so as to go, you what a little cooperation will do. Has the Alexandrian ambassador seen it? Mm-hmm. Seen it and loves it. <laughs> it looks for once as if we're going to get the jump on those eastern neighbors of his. Well, that all depends on how confidential the matter is kept until after Alexandria signed. I've got it, Mr. Barton. <clears throat> Hello? Yes, sir. Hold on just a moment, sir. He's right here. Me? It's the undersecretary. He sounds upset. Oh, oh, thanks. Hello? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir, that's right. Miss Clausen's typing them up now. It what? Well, I, I can't imagine how. Why, no, Mr. Secretary, of course not. Just the seven-man committee and the ambassador. Yeah. All right, sir. We'll be right over. Goodbye. What's wrong? Well, there's been a leak somewhere. On the trade agreement? Someone gave the whole story to the papers. When will they learn? When will they learn? We were going to publish the terms in a few days anyhow, weren't we? After it was signed, yes. Now, it may never be signed. I still don't see... You'll have a chance to. The undersecretary's called an informal meeting of the Trade Committee at his house. You'll be there to take minutes. Tonight? Eight o'clock. Uh, better finish typing up these notes. We'll pick up a sandwich on the way. <laughs> The undersecretary's home was over in Arlington, a dark, three-story mansion surrounded by a high iron fence and joined to the road by a gravel driveway lined with poplars. We arrived a few minutes before eight and were ushered into the library where the undersecretary and five members of the committee had already assembled. After the introductions were completed, the undersecretary crossed to a large mahogany desk, picked up a copy of that night's newspaper and pointed to a story on the front page. <coughs> I take it you've all seen this. It sets forth every single term of the trade agreement we're currently negotiating with the Alexandrian government. Uh, my office didn't release it. Perhaps one of you gentlemen can tell me how this happened. Mr. Secretary. Yes, Congressman. I think I can clear this up for you. I gave that story to the papers myself. Would you mind telling me why, sir? Because I believe the American people deserve to know what they're getting into. Uh -huh. You realize, I hope, although you weren't in complete accord with it, that this agreement conforms perfectly to the legal requirements of the Trade Act that you yourself helped pass in Congress? Then why the secrecy? Because we're still in a Cold War. 
You don't have to tell me about <coughs> cold wars, Mr. Secretary. I came home not long ago from a hot one. I served over two years in Korea as an infantry reservist. Well, then you must know the kind of enemy we're up against. They'll stop at nothing. They'll use every trick in the book. By releasing the terms of this trade agreement, you've given them a chance to make a counterproposal to the Alexandrian government that will look mighty juicy. What good are their proposals? They never live up to them. The Alexandrians know that as well as we do. Our Alexandrians know it, but what about their Alexandrians? They've got some, you know. Are you trying to tell me that government would accept a trade agreement with the East after all we've done for them? No, of course not. I'm only trying to show you how a counterproposal from the East could be used by our enemies in Alexandria to block the present government from signing with us. They'd get up in the assembly and fight our agreement with theirs. And in the end, they'd settle for a compromise. No agreement with anybody, which is all they want to accomplish in the first place. Well, all that proves to me, Mr. Secretary, is that if the present Alexandrian government isn't strong enough to force through a simple trade agreement, they aren't going to be much help to us. But don't you see that the very thing which can strengthen such a government is an agreement like this with the West? Frankly, Mr. Secretary, I don't. And if you think I broke this story just so the folks back home could see my name in print, you might notice it's not mentioned. I released the story anonymously. I'm not a headline hunter, but I believe there are plenty of people who won't like this. And you expect them to make their feelings known on the subject? I do. Even though most of your colleagues feel it's acceptable? I wasn't elected to support things I disagree with, no matter how many of my colleagues may feel they're acceptable. I see. I don't think you do. I'm trying to do right as I see right. That's why I was sent to Congress. I felt I had an obligation to release the terms of that agreement, so I did. And when I stop responding to the dictates of my conscience, no matter whom it inconveniences, then I'll know it's time for me to resign. The meeting broke up about three hours later with nothing settled at all. Even though it was after midnight when I got to the apartment, my roommate was still sitting up in bed reading. Jenny's been in government all her life, so I told her what had happened. Mm. Oh, sounds like it was quite a fight. It was. I've never seen two men so upset. And it was funny, but... Well, first I'd think the congressman was right, and, and then I'd think the undersecretary was right. I, I'm still undecided. Oh, so you should be. How do you figure that? Oh, well, because they're both right. Hmm? Yeah. See, the undersecretary is right in saying the agreement should have been kept secret until it was signed. And the congressman is right in saying his conscience wouldn't permit him to keep it secret. But if a majority of the people on the committee approve the agreement, well, shouldn't the congressman have accepted that verdict? You see, honey, what you forget is that the congressman represents another majority himself. The majority of the people in his district. Otherwise, well, he wouldn't have been elected. Well, it's too much for me. But I, I keep thinking there must be some way we can... Oh... Well, take the initiative in this fight. And still preserve all the rights of the citizenry? The person who thinks of a way to do that, well, it's... Well, what? Well, he may, may just save the world from destroying itself. Well, it's worth giving some thought to. Yeah. Uh, you have my word. I'll start on it first thing tomorrow. <laughs> Good night, Janie. Good night. When I arrived at the department the following morning, Mr. Bracken was already in his office. And he looked as if he had been there all night. Uh, Jane, I uh, want you to run off these memoranda and send them out as fast as you can. Did you come right back here after the meeting? No. No, no, I, I went home and slept a full two hours before the phone rang. What's up? Conference, big one. Here, look for yourself. Big one? Well, it can't get any bigger. Cabinet, joint chiefs, chairman of every congressional committee. What's it all about? I haven't any idea. Really. I, I wonder if... What? Oh, it's just a crazy idea. I, I was thinking last night how hard it is for a free country to, to win the... Well, I guess you'd say the psychological advantage in a Cold War. When everything it does has to be out in the open. 
Yeah, yeah. Pretty naughty problem. I'll bet if this bunch were to tackle it, they'd come up with something. <laughs> now, who knows? Maybe that's what they plan to tackle. I typed up the memoranda on the meeting. It was held the following day. You may have seen something about it in your newspaper, but not much. If you remember, everybody that was questioned by the reporters had the same thing to say. No comment. As you can imagine, the newspaper people didn't like that a bit. Come on, sir, come on. You won't be quoted. They must have spent those two hours talking about something. Well, if you like, yeah. you can print that we talked about nothing. Ah. Now, look, Congressman, I printed that story about the trade agreement and left you out of it. For which I'm very grateful. And I happen to know you don't support the administration's foreign policy. I've made no secret of that. So, if you want, I can handle this the same way as the trade agreement beat. Your name won't be mentioned, but at least you'll be getting the story before the people. Now, what exactly was covered at the meeting? All right, I'll tell you the truth. Nothing. <laughs> That's the way it went all over Washington for the next three days. You didn't read about it in the papers because, well, how could they print a story about nothing? But something came of that meeting, something very concrete. And the first inkling I got of it was on the following Friday, just after lunch. Jane? Yes, Mr. Bracken? Will you bring your book? Certainly. And your coat and hat. We're going on. Oh? We've been requested to attend an informal conference. Where? At 74 Patterson Street. 74 Patterson Street. The embassy address in Washington of an eastern satellite country that lay along the northern border of Alexandria. This was more than unusual. It was unheard of. In the past, whenever that embassy wished to get in touch with our department, which was seldom enough, it followed strict diplomatic protocol. Everything was handled through channels and in writing. But this meeting had been arranged very quickly over the phone. And even more astonishing, when we arrived at the embassy half an hour later, we were received not by the man who would have been Mr. Bracken's opposite number, but by the first secretary himself. Won't you sit down, Mr. Bracken? No. Well, thank you. Unless you feel it is absolutely necessary that Miss Clausen be present, our Mrs. Barossi here can transcribe the minutes. Well, I'd prefer that Miss Clausen remain. As you wish. No offense, Mrs. Barossi. Oh, not at all, Mr. Black. I looked at Mrs. Barossi, the embassy stenographer who had entered the room so quietly a few moments earlier. She was a small, thin woman in an unstylish brown dress, and her graying hair was pulled tightly back in a bun. Her face had no more expression than a mask. You are wondering, perhaps, Mr. Bracken, why I arranged this visit. Yes, sir. Frankly, I am. I have been requested by my own government, as well as other of the eastern countries, to make unofficial representations to your department in connection with the high policy meeting held just a few days ago. Uh, am I to understand, then, that you're speaking for the entire Eastern Bloc? Unofficially, of course, but yes. Mm. And uh, what are these representations you wish to make? Well, they concern the rather elaborate official silence which your government has preserved since the meeting in question. Yes? Of course, we know exactly what was discussed at the conference. Well, that's more than I do. Oh, we need not fence, Mr. Bracken. We know it, as well as you. I assure you, I know nothing. <laughs> Have it your own way. But the fact remains that, unofficially, of course, the governments I represent would like verbal assurance of your country's peaceful intentions toward the East. You would like assurance of our peaceful intentions? In light of the developments which took place at the conference. <clears throat> and Mr. Bidick, I'm afraid you've contacted the wrong man. In the first place, I honestly don't know what took place at the conference. Oh, oh, come, and Mr. Bracken. In the second, we have been giving assurances, unofficial, official, private, 
public, written and verbal, of our peaceful intentions toward the East ever since I can remember. Mr. Brecken, we are not fools. All this smoke screening you have done to obscure the purpose of that conference has not deceived us in the least. We know the United States government does not convene its highest officers to discuss nothing. No? No. They must have made policy decisions of the highest magnitude. You think we don't know that? Well, you just told me you knew exactly what they decided. No, we do. That is why my government wants assurances Now, of... look here, Mr. Blydick. If you really know what went on at that conference... Oh, we know, well, we know. if you do, then you already know whether our intentions are peaceful or not. We want assurances... Why? That... If the assurances conflict with the information you claim to have, they'll make no sense. If they don't conflict with it, well, you can't feel any safer than you do right now. That is not the point. Of course not. The point, the main point, is that we periodically make assurances in good faith of our peaceful intentions. Now, I have no doubt that we will continue to do so. But will these future assurances be worth anything? You claim to know what took place at the conference. The answer should be obvious. That's all there was to it. An informal get-together of two second-string diplomats that lasted less than 15 minutes. Thereafter, until the present, no further diplomatic overtures of that kind were made to the department. And in a way, that meeting might have been the end of the story, except for two curious, apparently unrelated events that took place just a few weeks ago. A prominent newspaper publisher came to Washington. And that night, Mrs. Barossi, the little stenographer in the Eastern Embassy, disappeared. I'll wash if you'll dry, Jane. Right with you, Jenny. I was just looking at the evening paper. Say, did you read uh, that about the newspaper publisher that visited the White House this afternoon? <laughs> just reading it now. <laughs> Boy, you know, he came in like a lion and went out like a lamb. <laughs> Whatever do you think they told him? I, I mean, to shut him up. <laughs> just what he said they told him. Nothing. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't add up. He's been one of the administration's most outspoken critics. He comes to Washington determined to find out what went on at that conference, and he goes away empty-handed and, and grinning like a Cheshire cat. Yeah, uh, look what he says down here at the bottom. Get mm -hmm. this. I have the greatest confidence in this most recent decision of our government, the eminent publisher was quoted as telling newsmen. But when pressed for details, he smiled broadly and replied, how can I give details when there are none? And this from a man who wasn't going to be put off with generalities. Well, whatever they decided, it certainly has the Eastern Bloc worried. Look here, purges, uprisings. Yeah, they're jittery, all right. I keep wondering if that first secretary really knew what happened at the conference. Well, whatever he found out, or guessed, seems to have thrown a real scare into his bosses. You expecting anybody? Me? No. I'll get it. Miss Clausen. Why, why, Mrs. Barossi. May I come in, please? I do not think I've been followed. Why, of course, come in. They, they would not suspect to trace me here. Who do you mean, they? Uh, I have left the embassy for good. Well, Jane, if you uh, want me to leave oh, for a nonsense, while... Nonsense, Jenny. Uh, this is Mrs. Barossi. I, I told you about her. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> How do you do? If I am intruding... Oh, no such thing. Here, sit down. Well, have you had your dinner yet? No, I... Uh, but I'm not hungry. Well, you sit right here and... I'll bring you a sandwich. Oh, no. No, you need not do oh, that. Just take me a minute. Oh. oh, she's very generous. Like... Like most Americans I have met. Is... Is there something I can help you with, Mrs. Barossi? I... I hope so. You said you left the embassy. You mean you're running away? I will never go back. But you're an Eastern National, aren't you? Yes, but uh, I've left no family behind me, no friends. There is nothing they can do. Uh, I, I need the name of a good lawyer, someone who will present my case for asylum to your government. I can handle that for you, I think. But... Uh, but that is not the main reason I came. 
I... I came to tell you something. If... if it's special intelligence, I can put you in touch with the correct people on that. No, no, no. It is not that kind of intelligence. I have very little of that, and it is unimportant things, mostly. This... this is something I would like to tell you because... Well, because your country should know it. Yes? It's... Uh, it's about that conference. The big one that was held not so long ago. Yes? I now realize what was decided at that conference by the leaders of your government. Here we are. Ham on white and cup of coffee. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I... I was just telling Miss Clausen that I now realize what your government agreed to do at that conference. The big one. Well, well uh, maybe you shouldn't be telling us this, Mrs. Barossi. No, this is something you must know. Because you must know that it is working. It's doing the thing it is intended to do. And that makes me very happy. What is doing the thing it was intended to do? The... That, that short, short period of official silence. Well, I don't think I understand. Someone in your government, someone very wise, has devised to turn one of your government's weaknesses into strength. What weakness? The fact that you have no political censorship, no silences as we do. That's a weakness? Yes. In the sense that it leaves your government powerless to force its people's thinking along certain lines. This makes your government weaker than the people, which is as it should be. Then how do you figure our weakness has become a strength? The period of official silence, it, it looks like censorship, but it isn't. Because there was nothing to censor. Your leaders told you the truth. They discussed nothing. They agreed to nothing. But to keep this period of silence. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm afraid I still fail to see how silence helps us. You have seen the sudden unrest in the eastern countries these past months? Yes. Well, you, you think the official silence produced that? Without doubt. Your country has capitalized on the greatest fear there is. Fear of the unknown. And in so doing, without sacrificing their liberties, they have regained the initiative. Hmm. For the time being, perhaps, but... Oh, for a long time, I assure you. In this country, the public will forget that period of official silence. Its, its impact will wear off. But your enemies will not forget. Even when they realize that that's all it was, just... Silence for the sake of silence? This they will never do. They will never accept that explanation. That is the ingenious part of this maneuver that your government has made. Your enemies will never forget the period of silence. They will never stop believing you are going to make the next move. And thus they will never be secure again. You, you sound very encouraging. Oh. I was encouraged enough to risk breaking with them. Their days are numbered. All their power has been built upon the blunders, the mistakes, the weaknesses of others. When people do something foolish or, or say something foolish, then they can take action. But where there are no words to grind propaganda against, where nothing has been said or done on which they can capitalize, they are powerless. I, I just can't believe that big conference was called for, for nothing. Nothing, as you call it, was the only thing that would work. As I said in the beginning, my name isn't Jane Clausen any more than the woman from the Eastern Embassy is called Mrs. Barossi. But her theory about the period of official silence is exactly as you heard it. Of course, it is just that, a theory.
This is Betty Lynn again. Have you heard the old one about the little boy who wanted to run away from home but couldn't because his mother had forbidden him to cross the street? <laughs> I only bring it up because for a moment I'd like to talk about running away. It's a very real problem, you know, and not at all confined to little boys. Most of us feel like running away at times, like getting away from it all and not having to think about our obligations and our responsibilities. As a matter of fact, the urge we feel to escape our problems is one of the main reasons people read fiction, go to the movies, watch television, or listen to radio plays. Merely by allowing ourselves to become involved in some dramatized situation, we forget our own problems and, and for a time actually do escape them. Then, when we have to face them again, we've had a small mental vacation and it helps us attack them with a little more vigor. I think you'll agree these days we need all the help we can get. Each week, Family Theater recommends another great aid for facing the problems of daily life. And that aid is prayer. Through prayer, we can obtain divine assistance for all of our problems. For when we pray, we're calling upon our Heavenly Father, who knows us, and our problems better than we do ourselves. We're asking him to show us the way to a solution. It's really just the opposite of running away. Actually, it's, well, it's more like going home for the answer. And it's always effective. May we suggest that when you pray, try daily family prayer, if you will, You'll be insuring yourself against one of today's most difficult problems, disunity in the home. For the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed No Comment, starring Betty Lynn. Others in our cast were John Stevenson, Ben Wright, Byron King, Gigi Pearson, Edgar Berrier, and Irene Tedrow. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by John T. Kelly, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program by the Mutual Network, which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lafrano expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to join us next week when family theater will present Enough Rope, starring J. Carol Nash. Rita Johnson will be your hostess. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America.